Good evening, everyone. Time for another silver update. Uh, this is hopefully I've made adjustments to my mic and to the gain, so hopefully the volume is better on this. And this is like my fifth take. If you hear a loud growling in the background, well, that's just because my stomach's growling, so I'm not going to retake over that. So uh, we're looking at the silver chart daily. And we're very healthy here. You can see the MACD is crossing over. It's a double positive because it's a positive cross of the zero line and a positive cross of the indicator itself, uh, the upward direction. The downtrending resistance line here that forms this sort of pennant is next up. We could go through that tonight. We could go through it tomorrow or we could not even touch it. You know, anything can happen. But... It wouldn't be surprising at all to see it even gap open through that tonight if there was some event or something going on. So the rest of the time I wanted to talk about a potential silver squeeze. That's something that uh, I heard, I was listening to Ron's basement and I heard Ron talking about a silver squeeze. And I just wanted to explore that concept a little bit because it's not as obvious um, initially the implications and the actual reality of what it is. So first we want to look at what is a squeeze because the term short squeeze actually comes from the stock market, not the commodities market. So uh, although we're going to look at Jesse Livermore and a squeeze he was involved in, well, a potential squeeze, we'll see. But, and he was involved in many squeezes uh, in other instances than the one that we're going to read. But uh, a squeeze traditionally is in stocks. And so here's a, an explanation from just Schwab, you know, but uh, it's kind of a generic explanation. I'm going to read it because I want to point out some things about uh, some misunderstandings about it. Uh, but this is the key points of the squeeze. A stock that rallies hy hyperbolically when there are no obvious current events driving the response, could be experiencing a short squeeze. And second, a short squeeze can potentially be worth trading, but only if you exercise great care. Well, that doesn't. Yeah. So um, let's go down to the explanations further because it gets a little bit clearer, but it's still very murky. Classic signs of a short squeeze can include a security that has a significant amount of short sellers, short interest, who believe the stock price is going to fall and then instead the stock price sharply rises, forcing many of these levered short sellers to quickly exit their positions, buying back the stock in the face of potentially increasing losses. So this kind of describes a short squeeze situation, but this, even though this describes the uh, sort of process of a squeezing, uh, it doesn't really give the reason why. It's not because they have to quickly exit, although that can increase the speed of price increases. But it's that they are upside down in a fundamental way as far as number of shares available to um, the direction of the price. We're going to see that. So, um, so they talk about GameStop and they, they talk about these other stocks that have been squeezed. But, uh, you know, they, they don't really get to the core of what a short squeeze is. Now, what they describe there, I would call a short rally or a short buyback rally or a fierce buyback rally. Um, and they said, well, it's not news. Well, often it is news it's uh, earnings come out and uh, projected earnings come out. Some news comes out about the company and a whole bunch of people were short the company and those people kind of stumble over each other to uh, buy back their shorts. But the question is, is, is that a squeeze? Well, no, it's not really a squeeze. Now, we're going to read a story here from Jesse Livermore's uh, from reminiscences of a stock operator in an actual squeeze situation in commodities as well. 
But uh, in stocks, what Livermore said was, he who sells what isn't hisn must buy it back or go to prison. And back in the old day, uh, you had to borrow something to sell it. So if it's a stock, you have to borrow it. Someone has to own it. Someone who is in the same brokerage as you were in and holds it in street name, you have to borrow it from them. And if your brokerage can't locate it, you can't short it. So that means that obviously, if that were the case, you could not short more shares than exist. But we're going to find out that that's not that uncommon of a situation. And there are many reasons that can be the case. Uh, but the main reason is that the markets are not honest and they're not being policed correctly. But so it can happen in stocks and it can happen in commodities. Now, this instance of commodities is where Livermore uh, was in a potential squeeze situation. And the reason this is so important to examine is to see how this was resolved. So I'm going to read this. This is Livermore trading back around the First World War. And uh, he had had a lot of ups and downs and he had just got his money back. So he was going to make a big commodity trade. So he says, by July 1917, I not only had been able to pay off all my debts, but was quite a little to the good besides. This meant I now had the time, the money, and the inclination to consider trading in commodities as well as stocks. For many years, I've made it my practice to study all the markets. The advance in commodity prices over the pre-war level ranged from 100 to 400 percent. There was only one exception, and that was coffee. Of course, there was a reason for this. The breaking out of the war meant the closing up of European markets and huge cargoes were sent to this country, which was the one big market. That led in time to an enormous surplus of raw coffee here, and that in turn kept the price low. Why, when I first began to consider its speculative possibilities, coffee was actually selling below pre-war prices. If the reasons for this anomaly were plain, no less plain was it that the active and increasingly efficient operation by the German and Austrian submarines must mean an appalling reduction in the number of ships available for commercial purposes. This eventually, in turn, must lead to dwindling imports of coffee. With reduced receipts and an unchanged consumption, the surplus stocks must be absorbed. Sound uh, familiar? Surplus stocks must be absorbed. And when that happened, the price of coffee must do what prices of all other commodities had done, which was go way up. It didn't require Sherlock Holmes to size up the situation. Why everybody did not buy coffee, I cannot tell you. When I decided to buy it, I did not consider it a speculation. It was much more of an investment. I knew it would take time to cash in, but I knew also that it was bound to yield a good profit. That made it a conservative investment operation a conservative investment operation a banker's act rather than a gambler's play. I started my buying operations in the winter of 1917. I took quite a lot of coffee. The market, however, did nothing to speak of. It continued inactive, and as for the price, it did not go up as I had expected. The outcome of all was that I simply carried my line to no purpose for nine long months. My contracts expired then, and I sold out all my options. I took a whopping big loss on that deal, and yet I was sure my views were sound. I had been clearly wrong in the matter of time, but I was confident that coffee must advance as all commodities had done. So that no sooner... Now, one thing that's implied here that you might not have noticed is that Livermore is telling you right there that uh, inflation is a monetary phenomenon because he expected all commodities to go up. It wasn't the commodities that were causing, uh, it wasn't the shortages or uh, the supplies or the demand for commodities that was causing commodity prices to rise, but it was the inflation created by the war that caused all commodities across the board to rise in price. And he was just waiting for coffee, the last one, to rise as well. So that no sooner than I had sold out my line that I started in to buy again, I bought three times as much coffee as I had so unprofitably carried during those nine disappointing months. Of course, I bought deferred options 
for as long as a time as I could get. I was not so wrong now. As soon as I had taken on my troubled line, the market began to go up. People everywhere seemed to realize all of a sudden what was bound to happen in the coffee market. It began to look as if my investment was going to return me a mighty good rate of interest. The sellers of the contracts I held were roasters, mostly of German names and affiliations, who had bought the coffee in Brazil, confidently expecting it, expecting to bring it to this country. But there were no ships to bring it. And presently they found themselves in the uncomfortable position of having no end of coffee down there and being heavily short of it to me up here. Please bear in mind that I first became bullish on coffee while the price was practically at pre-war level. And don't forget that after I bought it, I carried it the greater part of a year and took a big loss on it. The punishment for being wrong is to lose money. The reward for being right is to make money. Being clearly right and carrying a big line, I was justified in expecting to make a killing. It would not take much of an advance to make my profit satisfactory to me, for I was carrying several hundred thousand bags. I don't like to talk about my operations and figures because sometimes they sound rather formidable and people might think I was boasting. As a matter of fact, I trade in accordance to my means and always leave myself an ample margin of safety. In this instance, I was conservative enough. The reason I bought options so freely was because I couldn't see how I could lose. Conditions were in my favor. I had been made to wait a year, but now I was going to be paid both for my waiting and for being right. I could see the profit coming fast. There wasn't any cleverness about it. It was simply that I wasn't blind. Coming sure and fast, that profit of millions, but it never reached me. No, it wasn't sidetracked by a sudden change in conditions. The market did not experience an abrupt reversal of form. Coffee did not pour into the country. What happened? The unexpectable. What had never happened in anyone's ex anybody's experience. What I had therefore had no reason to guard against. I added a new one to the long list of hazards of speculation that I must always keep before me. It was simply that the fellows who had sold me the coffee, the shorts, knew what was in store for them, and in their efforts to squirm out of the position into which they had sold themselves, they devised a new way of welshing. They re rushed to Washington for help and got it. Perhaps you remember that the government had evolved various plans for preventing further profiteering in necessities. You know how most of them worked. Well, the philanthropic coffee shorts appeared before the price fixing committee of the War Industries Board. I think that it was the official designation and it made a patriotic appeal to that body to protect the American breakfaster. They asserted that a professional speculator, one Lawrence Livingston, had cornered or was about to corner coffee. If his speculative plans were not brought to naught, he would take advantage of the conditions created by the war and the American people would be forced to pay exorbitant prices for their daily coffee. It was unthinkable to the patriots who had sold me cargoes of coffee they couldn't find ships for, by the way, they were German patriots, that 100 millions of Americans, more or less, should pay tribute to the consciousless speculators. They represented the coffee trade, not the coffee gamblers, and they were willing to help the government curb profiteering, actual or prospective. Now, I have a horror of whiners, and I do not mean to intimate that the price fixing committee was not doing its honest best to curb profiteering and wastefulness but that need not stop me from expressing the opinion that the committee could not have gone very deeply into the particular problem of the coffee market they fixed on a maximum price for raw coffee and also fixed a time limit for the closing out of all existing contracts so there you go there's this is what we see time and again when big people or powerful people or important people who have connections to politicians get in trouble in financial markets, they fix things. In this case, they fixed on a maximum price for raw coffee. So they just set a maximum price. You can't charge any more than that. 
and a time limit for closing out of existing contracts. So they basically ended the market. This decision meant, of course, that the coffee exchange would have to go out of business. There was only one thing for me to do, and I did it, and that was to sell out all my contracts. Those profits of millions that I had deemed as certain to come my way as any I had ever failed to complete as any I had ever made, failed to completely materialize. I was and am as keen as anybody against the profiteer in the necessities of life, but at the same time, the price fixing committee made their ruling on coffee. All the other commodities were selling from 250 to 400% above pre-war prices, while raw coffee was actually below the average prevailing price for some years before the war. I can't see that it made any real difference who held the coffee. The price was bound to advance, and the reason for that was not the operations of the consciousless speculators, but the dwindling surplus for which the diminishing importations were responsible, and they in turn were affected exclusively by the appalling destruction of the world's ships by the German submarines. The committee did not wait for for coffee to start. They clamped on the brakes. As a matter of policy and of expediency, It was a mistake to force the coffee exchange to close just then. If the committee had let the coffee alone, had let coffee alone, the price undoubtedly would have risen for the reasons I had already stated, which had nothing to do with any alleged corner. But the high price, which need not have been exorbitant, would have been an incentive to attract supplies to this market. I have heard Mr. Bernard Baruch say that the War Industries Board took into consideration this factor the ensuring of a supply and fixing prices. And for that reason, some of the complaints about the high limit on certain commodities were unjust. When the coffee exchange resumed business later on, coffee sold at 23 cents. The American people paid the price, paid that price because of the small supply. And the supply was small because the price had been fixed too low. At the suggestion of philanthropic shorts to make it possible to pay the high ocean freights and thus ensure continued importations. I've always thought that my coffee deal was the most legitimate of all my trades and commodities. I considered it more of an investment than a speculation. I was in it over a year. If there was any gambling, it was done by the patriotic roasters with German names and ancestry. They had coffee in Brazil and they sold it to me in New York. The price fixing committee fixed the price of the only commodity that had not advanced. They protected the public against profiteering before it started, but not against the inevitable higher prices that followed. So there you go. Now there's a perfect example of, that's not a short squeeze, that's a person being accused of a short squeeze, actually a corner, which is where uh, in a commodity, if you have enough contracts, you can corner a commodity, if you have enough uh, positions in everything. So, the government changed the rules. Now, how does this apply to silver? Well, if there's a silver squeeze, we know that the squeeze is not going to be like a stock squeeze because when stocks get squeezed, the issue is who owns the shares uh, because it's shares. We're not talking about ounces. We're talking about pieces of paper that have ownership and who controls how many pieces of paper? Well, supposedly the company, but in reality, who controls? Well, that's that's the big issue of uh, the great taking. That's a big issue of the DTCC. That's a big issue of rehabilitation. Uh, these are all big issues in a real short squeeze in a stock. And uh, I am on the side that There are actually many ways for there to be a real short squeeze in a stock because there are actually many ways, in my opinion, for counterfeit stock shares to exist, whether that's um, the, you know, the DTCC, uh, various brokerages. Um, uh, I think we've had a lot of evidence in the last 20 or 30 years of certain stocks and certain people involved with them reporting that apparently more shares of their stock have been shorted than even existed. Now, this is where you can get a real squeeze because if there is a panic to buy back shares of a stock 
and the existing float is actually less than um, than what that person is buying, then then the price can go to infinity. There isn't a price because there isn't enough stock. So when you think of a squeeze, think of like a person in a suit that's too small. They're being squeezed. There's not enough suit for the amount of person there. So they're bulging out of the suit. Same thing with a short squeeze in a stock. In a, in a, in a real short squeeze, they actually the shorts have actually sold more than they can get their hands on to get out of the position. And when that happens, and of course when Livermore was doing it, he was involved in pools where they, they the major holders of a stock signed a contract and agreement all together to create a pool and limit themselves by contract. They cannot sell any of their shares. And so those shares are locked up. So they know how many shares are out there and they know if they've caught a short selling more than really exists. And you would, you'd have to ask, well, how can that happen? Well, it can happen if some of the brokerages are operating as bucket shops and they aren't really ex, uh, doing the trades on the, uh, on the stock exchange, but they're bucketing the trades. Um, there, there's a lot of ways that it can happen. It has happened, it can happen, and it will happen again. And uh, so when you translate that over to a commodity like silver, then the issue becomes how do you take delivery and where do you take delivery? Because with a stock, it's a lot easier. It's, it's sort of electronic now even. It used to be, you know, uh, paperwork shuffled here and there, but now it's all electronic. So you can actually take delivery and the number of shares that exist these are all digits on computers. Nobody knows the veracity of these things. But in the case of a real squeeze for delivery, sorry about that, a real squeeze for delivery uh, in a commodity where what's being squeezed is the physical commodity to be delivered, where someone has promised a certain amount of a physical commodity and, and the people who have bought it are expecting delivery, they're exercising. Uh, in that case, that's different than the stock situations. Um, and you can see by what the war board did with Livermore's position, they basically canceled the trade. So Livermore was gonna make probably $3 million. Now that's not analogous to uh, silver stackers because Livermore was long the paper. He had contracts and he was long, so he didn't have the commodity. He was expecting to be delivered the commodity and there was uh, reneging going on. So this, the, the interference with the markets, the reneging, and he lost his money. So uh, that's not the case for silver stackers because they're all, they already have their long. They don't have a leveraged long like Livermore had, but they have a, a one for one long physically in their possession. So obviously the squeeze is gonna happen in the paper market and we know from past examples and this one with Livermore is just another example that the government changed the rules. They did that with the Hunt brothers. That was also a paper squeeze. The Hunt brothers initially in 1979, the Hunt brothers uh, in 1971, two, three and four, the Hunts were initially accumulating uh, during this rise right here, they were accumulating physical silver but they, through the end part of this, they started to accumulate uh, long contracts and they also borrowed money and that's, that's how they got them. So that was a paper situation. Uh, they, could they have stood for delivery? I suppose if they would have had all the dollars to back it, but apparently they had borrowed too much. So they had over leveraged themselves and we all know what happened. Uh, a parabolic spike and then a crash and it took uh, a long time to get back to those prices. And we're still trying to get back to them again the third time. So um, what does that mean for the future? Um, again, it's gonna come down to the COMEX. Is the COMEX the only place you can get delivery? Now, as Livermore said, when that failure happened, that would be the end of the coffee exchange. Now, it wasn't the end of the coffee exchange because there wasn't a failure, there was a change. But note that what happened was that 
even though one particular trader's uh, paper profits were taken away, uh, the price of the underlying commodity rose just as he had anticipated, and then after this event stayed high. So the analogy for silver would be, you know, if we get into a situation where certain entities find out that other entities have actually shorted more than they are able to deliver physically, and those other entities force the physical delivery, then that will result in the same sort of things that we saw uh, with Livermore. The difference being that the silver market is a worldwide market, although it's not traded in too many countries. But if this happened on the COMEX, and there's some indications that it could because the COMEX seems to be lagging the Chinese market, then if this happens on the COMEX, then that basically just kind of destroys their reputation, their credibility. It becomes very hard to uh, reestablish that if you've defaulted on a delivery, why would it, why would an, an industrial or an investment uh, user or producer why would they want to trust you again? Why would why would they not just go directly to the people who produce the commodity or other exchanges that have never defaulted on delivery? So you know that's. That's the quandary. Yes, they can change the rules. And yes, uh, you can be cheated even if you're right and uh, you're in the middle of a squeeze and the people have, the people on the other side of the trade have counterfeited things and are, are liars and cheats and thieves. The whole thing, you can be 100% right and just like Livermore, you can lose. So that's, uh, that's what happens in a short squeeze. If conditions are correct, then yes, an infinite price can be demanded by the longs who have bought uh, bought the underlying, but the people who sold it to them can't deliver it to them. So uh, as a group, they have to scramble over each other and, and just to drive the price to infinity in theory. And of course, before that happens, the government's going to close the market and change the rules. That's when you have to just sit and wait because when these things happen, there's no point in trading. You just want to wait until the dust clears and see what comes out on the other end. As they saw with coffee, they came out with much, much higher prices. I think if we have a short squeeze of physical silver that takes out the comics, yeah, um, you know, multiples, multiples higher and then probably a re-emergence of the market somewhere else in the world. Maybe the U.S. starts to quote that one, or maybe the U.S. tries to open another exchange. But yeah, that would be the end of the exchange if they massively defaulted on deliveries because no one would have any reason to use them anymore. And we'll talk to you next time.